So the next part is going to be on particle tech detectors, and this is intended to be a short introduction, not a comprehensive introduction. Um, so if you look at most of the large, most of the active particle detectors, they tend to look a lot the same. Um, most of them uh, are wrapped around the beam pipe, and then you build out around the beam pipe, so, so you have different layers like an onion. Um, I am going to focus on the ELISE detector, which is still currently where most of my research is um, focused on, but <clears throat> the principle is the same. And you can think about the main purpose of these detectors as primarily acting as a camera, taking pictures of um, the particles coming out from the collision. So um, you need to know, you know, the difference is that you have depending on the accelerator and the year and so on, you have collisions happening typically about a thousand times a second. It's really fast. So when you can't sit there and tell the, um, <clears throat> tell your detector when to start recording data. So you have um, one class of detectors that are trigger detectors that tell you when you have a collision. So when you should start recording data. There's another set of detectors that are tracking detectors that tell you where particles went as they came out from the collision. Almost all of these detectors work by looking at charged particles ionizing um, the detectors. So that means that um, a charged particle created in the collision comes out and it, as it moves through the detector, it will knock electrons out of the material in the detector. And then you use, um, electric fields and you basically draw the charge out and you look at where the charge is, um, where the charge goes to try to figure out where the track went. Um, most of these are, so these are pretty much sensitive only to charged particles um, because neutral particles are a lot harder to measure. You have particle identification detectors. They tell you what kind of particle it is. Um, most of them work by um, telling you, you, you do a simultaneous measurement of the momentum and the velocity, and that gives you a measurement of the mass so you know what kind of particle it is. And then you have calorimeters that tell you how much um, energy you have. So if I go with the, um, the camera analogy, the trigger detectors are sort of like the, um, the button you push to take a picture. The tracking detectors give you a black and white picture. Particle identification detectors give you color. And calorimeters give you maybe infrared as well. The details of every different detector um, vary, but they all, um, they all, most detectors can be classed into one of these different main types. And what you get, now the what you get out of this is something that looks like a picture of all of the particles coming out from the collision. So here you can see a proton-proton collision in the ELISE detector, and what you see is the, um, the, the curved tracks are um, the trajectories of particles as they fly out. Um, so what I, uh, let me go back a bit, in this, um, in this picture, what you see here is, first of all, the beam line. So the beam line comes right, goes straight through the detector. So this is where you have one set of particles going in one direction and another set going in the other direction. And then you usually design the detector so that when everything goes well, most of the collisions happen exactly in the center of the detector where your detector works best. And then the entire thing is in a, um, an electric and a magnetic field. So when you have a charged particle moving in a magnetic field, it's going to curve, just like you guys learned in freshman physics. So, and the, the radius of curvature is proportional to the momentum. And then um, you usually have an electric field which draws those electrons coming out of the um, detector material towards the ends. So this is a proton-proton collision. What's been done here is that they've done something called tracking. So the raw data 
actually looks like a series of hits along one of these tracks. And then um, you have to have, you have a set of software that um, tries to connect these um, so that you can tell where particles went. Um, and that is a highly non-trivial problem, but mostly it's done centrally for the collaboration. So most of the time, even grad students aren't worried too much about those hits. They're using the final, um, the objects where they're looking at the, the tracks themselves. And then this is an example of a heavy ion collision. So now you have a lot more particles. How many more depends on the collision energy and the system. Um, but in lead lead, it's um, the lead at LHC energies, it's something like 50 tracks in a typical proton proton collision at most to something more like 2000 tracks um, within the main part of the detector. So a lot of tracks. And I will pause there and see if anybody has questions on that was a big picture overview not a detailed overview um, of detectors there's a lot more details who usually does the tracking that's a good question so um, these experiments the smaller experiments that are active today have still on the order of 500 people so um, the labs typically hire people who help with this. Sometimes graduate students do get involved, but they're not starting from scratch. And um, you start with software that worked before. And then there is a central effort to do what we call reconstruction, which is how you go from the raw data points to these tracks themselves. Um, so typically you start with existing software and you're optimizing it. And once it works, someone has to make sure that the, the reconstruction is done on all of the data, um, but it's not necessarily um, how much effort that takes depends on where an experiment is in its life cycle. So at the beginning of an experiment, there's usually a couple people working full time to make sure that the tracking is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, whereas at the end, it may, it may be a fraction of someone's time because what they're really doing is making sure it's still doing what it's supposed to do. There are a lot of, I, it also kind of depends on what your definition of doing the tracking is because you do have people looking at quality assurance for each of the detectors and making sure that you, you have, that your tracks make sense. Um, so for instance, on my last shift on the STAR experiment, the multiplicity went up, so something called space charge was a lot higher, which meant that you had a lot of ions in the detector, so the electric field was not what it was supposed to be. And when you looked at the event displays while we were taking data, the calibration tracks from lasers, which are supposed to be straight, were bent. So that tells you that a lot of corrections need to be done before you use that data. Um, but it doesn't tell you what the problem is right away. So it, if you're doing QA quality assurance, that doesn't, I'm not sure that counts as tracking. Um, it's usually a communal effort in general. Um, so this question, let me, so make sure that I can. The question was, I mentioned that if all goes well, collisions happen in the very center. Is this center region a few cubic centimeters 
how much error can we have in defining this region? Um, and I, so this varies by the accelerator. So um, I'm going to share the whiteboard. Um, and I didn't say anything about the accelerator. Um, so, or, or the collider. So in a collider, you typically have two beams of particles, um, one in going in opposite directions. Um, <clears throat> so this is what it looks like uh, in the big picture, but what's actually going on is that you have little tiny bunches like beads on a necklace. Um, and on the scale, when you're looking from the um, from an air down from an airplane, it looks like the beams are pretty much in the same spot. But if you look closer on the scale of the beam pipe, what you will see is that actually each of these beams, first of all, they have a finite width. So it's not, um, they're, if you have a bunch of lead ions, they're not at one little tiny point, but you have um, the, the direction, actually, let me draw it a little bit differently. Um, so you have sort of a track that they will follow and inside you have bunches. And the other beam has bunches too. And then you can only have collisions where these two bunches cross. And this is called the interaction diamond. Um, and at the Large Hadron Collider, um, that interaction diamond is plus or minus about 10 centimeters. So the whole thing's about 20 centimeters from the center of the detector. Um, and then the, at the um, relativistic heavy ion collider, they've worked on trying to, I believe the design spec was the same as the Large Hadron Collider, um, but the actual interaction diamond was more like 60 centimeters and they've worked on making it smaller. I'm not sure what the latest was, what the best they could do was. But this is also a statistical process. So for any given collision, it's going to happen at one spot here. A lot, so one spot around the detector. And you actually can get, um, you can get some, because you have a statistical distribution of where the ions are in the um in the bunch so you can get some collisions that happen slightly outside of that interaction diamond. um let me go back to the chat and make sure that i so it you we usually don't talk about it in terms of cubic centimeters the relevant distance is the length of that interaction diamond around uh, along the beam pipe, usually the beams are, the beam pipe is on the order of centimeters, depending which collider you're talking about. And then the, um, and then the, the width of the beam is also on the order of a centimeter or two. That's the diameter is like a, a centimeter or two. Um, you actually do, it, there's a lot of cool details about this as well. Um, so at the Large Hadron Collider, the ELISE detector is slower than ATLAS or CMS, so they actually make the bunches larger in the ALIS interaction region so that you have a lower collision rate. Um, but at ATLAS and CMS, they squeeze the, the bunch down to have the smallest diameter they can so that you get the highest collision rate possible. Um, there was a question, how do you accelerate them to the speed of light or at least close to that? In a lot of very slow stages. So um, here I'm going to go back to um, 
the slide I had of the colliders um, because what you see is um, a bunch of different um, a bunch of different accelerators. And on the fly, I'm gonna remember all of the names incorrectly, so I'm going to just avoid mentioning them by name. Um, but both um, both the Large Hadron Collider and the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider have these. You start with uh, you start with some ions that have um, just a few electrons stripped out of them, and when you do that. Um, you can accelerate them in a tandem accelerator so that just by using an electric field you get them going faster and then um, you have a few different stages so they start out fairly slow and um, you send them through a foil so that it strips more and more electrons off of them at that point um, because you have a sample of ions you actually have a mixture of different charge states. So you send them through, let's see if I can, I've lost my ability to mark up on this screen, um, but you send them through uh, another accelerator. So you send them through a turn with a magnetic field and that lets you select the charge state um, so that you're sure um, which charge state you have. And then you send them into a smaller, well, a larger accelerator, and then another larger accelerator. So at um, at Rick, it's a tandem accelerator, um, which is basically just a giant that uh, you send them through an electric field, and followed by a booster accelerator, and then the um, alternating gradient gradient synchrotron, and then finally they're injected into the relativistic heavy ion collider, and um, at each of these stages, actually, it's a clever trick. They are using, um, once you get into the, the relativistic heavy ion collider, you're actually using electromagnetic radiation at, to accelerate them so that um, when, you have, um, when you have an electric field, uh, when you have, an elect have electromagnetic radiation, you have, um, you have an electric field that varies with space and um, it will accelerate. So if you have a bunch of, um, if you have a bunch of ions in here, it will accelerate the slower ions. Let me actually try to draw this a little bit. So it's got some dimensions. So the electric field actually works to accelerate the slower ions and slow and decelerate the faster ions so that you get um, a focusing effect from the electromagnetic radiation. And you just slowly change that um, the, um, the radiation and the magnetic field to slowly bring it up to, um, to the right speed, to the, to the speed you're at. Although at those speeds you usually quantify it in terms of not the speed but um but in terms of gamma because the the speeds are so close to the speed of light that it's not convenient to use the the speed itself And then let's see. So I think that answers the questions. Um, if I don't see other questions, then I'm gonna ah. Do you do you use the tracks to reconstruct jets, or how do you relate tracks to primary particles? I am going to come back to jets because jets are a whole different can of worms. I have two different sections on jets. Um, the question of how you relate the tracks to primary particles is a really good one. So um, I am going to, so what your raw data look like. So here's the beam pipe. 
and then here's your detector. And so we're looking at the beam coming in and out of the board here. And your raw data are actually hits. And so if you have, so you have little points along the track. If you have only a few points, it is not too hard to draw a line between them and say, this is my track. Um, what you usually do <clears throat> is you actually start from the outer edge where the hit density is lower and you basically try to inch your way all the way in. Um, and there is an assumption that one of those tracks, something that is basically a continuous line, um, is probably cor probably corresponds to what was left by a single particle. And the ambiguities in that are basically what comprise a lot of the systematic uncertainties in the measurement. So. Um, what we can do is that we simulate the detector and we um, simulate what happens when you have a charged particle going through the material of your detector. And um, you can say, okay, when I have a pion, a, pi, a positively charged pion going through my detector, it leaves this many tracks and it, <coughs> this is how it behaves. And you test your software for reconstructing tracks um, on those simulations. Um, and you can also do things like put your parts of your detector in a test beam where you know the energy and the particle type of the particles that your detector is getting hit with. And you can make sure that it behaves the way that you think that it should. Um, and most of the time, in a typical analysis that gets published, you have a lot of hits along that line. So in the ELISE detector, you have, if, if a track goes through the time projection chamber, which is the main tracking detector, you have 135 points along that track. So, um, and you require for a good track, you require something like 80% of the, of the possible hits. And then there's other detectors that um, called the inner tracking um, system that give you another six hits. Um, but there is an assumption there that if you can form a continuous line, that it comes from one particle. This is why we do, um, we have a bunch of quality assurance cuts. So when you fit the track to a line where you assume that the line is curving in a trajectory to match the magnetic field, you, um, <clears throat> you get a chi-squared um, on the track where chi-squared is, well, actually, let me do a new sheet. Chi-squared is um, the value, the sum over the um, number of points of the value you observe minus the value you predict quantity squared divided by the uncertainty squared. So you get this chi squared and that gives you a measure of the quality of the track. And there are a number of ways that you can throw out things you think are bad tracks, which is an imperfect process. So depending on your detector, you usually throw out good tracks erroneously, and sometimes you have bad tracks erroneously. Um, and the devil is in the details. So that's a very good question. Are there situations where there are several tracks near each other from one primary particle? I think that what you're talking about is that um, I actually have one real particle um, 
but I have erroneously reconstructed it as two. So something like that. Yes, that happens. Most of the time, so you have different ways that the tracking, the trackers can work. Um, often you let, you insist that, uh, you require that each hit is associated with one track. Um, and it is usually associated with the track where it is, which it is closest to. And if you do that, then in this case where you get two tracks from the same particle, um, neither of those tracks, well, in this case that I drew, each of those tracks has about half the number if, of possible hits. So in the Elise detector, if you have 135 um, possible hits, you know, one of the tracks might have 70 hits and the other has 60 and then some of the other hits went somewhere else because they didn't get associated. Um, so usually your track quality cuts would cut that out and so that track would not enter your sample. That also means that you then would not have reconstructed this particle. Um, there can be cases where you have, you know, here's your particle and um, the hits that it actually left. Maybe your particle does something where it then hits detector material and it is deflected. And then you suddenly have, um, you have hits, but um, they don't all line up along the expected trajectory. So then you could reconstruct it as this track and a shorter track. <clears throat> this shorter track um, is not going to have very many hits and it's not going to start near the primary vertex. So most analyses would actually not use it. So um, if I go back here, so another cut that you usually do to make sure that you have good tracks is that you require that your track is close to the primary vertex. So if you have a track hanging out over here, you would not use it in your analysis. There are analyses where you're trying to analyze those tracks because you're looking at things that can create shorter stub tracks like that but then you have to be very careful about the track quality. And then you also have to be careful about, um, about fake tracks that were not, you know, things that were not actually from a part of it. There's a ton of potential details. My guess is that most of you as undergraduates would not deal with those types of details unless you're working on a detector and trying to do the tracking. <clears throat> All right. So. 